morning shine, 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 Las Vegas shine your light on me. Welcome to Las Vegas Tonight with your award-winning host, Dale Davidson. Dale interviews fascinating guests from top-ranked celebrities to people just like you who have an important story to tell. For more than 15 years, Dale is broadcast every week from the fabulous Las Vegas Strip. He finds the people who really make Las Vegas a one-of-a-kind city and lets the world know just what's happening in this remarkable town. You'll discover why 50 million people visit the entertainment capital of the world every year. Stay tuned for another exciting episode of Las Vegas Tonight. Welcome to Las Vegas Tonight. I'm your host, Dale Davidson. Each and every episode, we do our best to bring you interesting, fascinating, wonderful guests. We've certainly done it this time. We're very pleased to have with us the famous, <laughs> the godly, the terrific John Ponder. John? Dale, thank you so it's much for having me. It's good to see you again. Good to see you too. Yeah. It's been a yeah, while. Yeah. You've been to the White House several times since I've seen you last. Yes. Which not everybody can make that claim. <laughs> you know, that's really nice. Yes. That's a yes. wonderful thing. Um, who would have guessed that um, our esteemed president, and I, and I honor him, uh, would become a Christian? Right. Yeah. I think if you look back over 20 years ago, you know, probably no one saw it coming. Yeah. But uh, praise God that he is doing some gigantic work in, uh, in our president's life. Yeah. You know, when he, I knew he meant it, and he was uh, the real deal, when he worked so hard to, uh, to get the Johnson Amendment mm -hmm. um, eliminated and, and freed up pastors to talk about politics, which is an important part of life. Right. And, uh, you know, I hope the pastors do so. Right. You know, I really do. And I think that they are. Um, do you? Um, you know, I think that they, a lot of people are very excited yeah. uh, at that. That was, you know, the, the talk uh, from, you know, from the platform, oh, yeah. um, you know, Sundays after that. So it just, you know, it, it gives, you know, give, give folks an opportunity to be able to, you know, to, to utilize that platform. It's important. Very much so. It's important. Uh, if you don't mind, I want to read from my notes a little bit to sure. let people know what an honor it is to have this gentleman with us on Las Vegas tonight. As you probably know, John Ponder is the founder of Hope for Prisoners. He was appointed um, by Governor Brian Sandoval, our uh, former governor, to the Nevada Sentencing Commission in 2017, was then appointed to the Governor's Reentry Task Force and the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights Nevada State Advisory Committee in 2016. He's a commissioner with the Nevada Commission on Post-Secondary Education. Uh, first and foremost, I think, he's an ordained chaplain with Chaplaincy Nevada. He oversees all aspects of the programs and services provided by Hope for Prisoners, including a comprehensive array of pro program components designed to assist in individuals in successfully reintegrating into society. And you're doing a great job. Yeah, well, praise God. How long has uh, Hope for Prisoners been, uh, been in business? Yeah, so we've been up and running uh, since 2009 when we first had a chance to um, you know, hit the ground running. I uh, started working with our first group of people at the end of 2010, yeah. and God breathed on the work, and we never looked back from there. It's a it, there's a real need for this, isn't there? Oh, very and much for, so. And for many years, prisoners, uh, you know, had to live with that with that black mark against them for years and years and years. Mm -hmm. And uh, and now with uh, with your wonderful ministry and the police cooperating, which right. is a great thing. Uh, there is indeed hope for prisoners. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, the doors have really, really opened up because people begin to understand the importance of people who have paid their debt to society. Correct. But when they're coming back home to our community, you know, we have to come up with creative ways to, to engage them, embrace them, and open up, uh, you know, open up doors for them to help them to be successful. Yes. Um, let's talk about your life a little bit so people get to know you. Sure. Um, 
Where did you grow up? Yeah, so I grew up uh, in New York, uh -huh. uh, the product of a single parent home. You know, dad left home at a very early age, mm -hmm. left mom raising, you know, five knucklehead boys and one knucklehead girl oh, all by boy. herself. Wow. Uh, you know, that's God the story. Mom. Yeah, my goodness. It was it was the prayers of mom. And but growing up inside that environment without, you know, dad in the home, you know, my brothers and I, the streets led us to the drugs, drugs led us to the gangs, gangs led us to criminal activity. And that criminal activity for me uh, landed me uh, in my very first set of handcuffs at the tender age of 12 years old. Oh my lord, yeah. Right. And so that was a juvenile charge and and you never look back? Was was there a constant stream of of uh, bad acts going on? Oh absolutely, 100%, yeah. but you know, that, that from 12 years old, uh, you know, I caught my first felony conviction at 16 years old. Oh boy. Uh, the, and uh, life just kind of spiraled out of control out of there. It was like stuck in this rut of never ending in and out of uh, jail system, prison, drug addictions, and, and things of that nature. Wow. Now, schooling, were you able to, to get an education with all of those interruptions? Right. You know, I think that somewhere around 17 years old, um, um, my mom cracked the whip and made me go back and get my GED. Good. Uh, so Good was able her. to do that. Uh, yeah. But again, life was still spiraling out of control. Yeah. Now, uh, your, your final stretch in uh, in prison was for bank robbery. That is correct. So you were doing that for, uh, to make a living at yeah. that point? I, it was not, banks? not only to make a living, but to feed a, uh, an atrocious drug habit oh, okay. uh, that, you know, that I had. But, you know, that was a turning point uh, for me because I found myself in that prison cell and I was facing the single greatest adversity of my entire life. I'm facing the possibility of spending the next 23 years of my life behind 50 foot walls. Wow. Right. So, um, you know, I found myself broken. Uh, confused, alone, and I had a conversation with God in a prison cell, and, and I played a let's make a deal with God. <laughs> Tell me about it. Yeah. So, Tell me about so, what, how, how did it happen, and how did you hear from yeah, the Yeah, so, so face all the time, I was dealing with a lot of anger, man, the addictions, I'm sure. fighting people in jail, and they, they put me inside solitary confinement, close the door, yeah. and I'm on a hunger strike, I don't want to talk to anybody, don't want to eat, and uh, I'm there for about a week, right, just, again, just very angry, and there was a chaplain who had come to the prison door and he opened up the little food flap there and he said something to me like, you know, Jesus loves you. And I called that man everything but the name his mom gave him. <laughs> but before he closed that door, he dropped the Bible through the little food flap and closed the door and said, Jesus loves you and walked away and I left the Bible on the door. And about a week or so later, he came back again and I'm still angry. I hadn't picked up the Bible. And uh, you know, he it's said, still lying there. I'm just, it's still laying on the floor. But when yeah. he opened up the flap, said Jesus loves you, he dropped a daily devotional through the door, right? And, yes. um, and I left it on the floor and out of boredom, Dale, maybe three weeks later, I'm sitting on the stool and I looked down and I saw the Bible and looked at the daily devotional. I opened up the daily devotional to whatever day I thought that it was. And, you and, weren't right, sure. I wasn't even sure. And I started <laughs> reading the little, the, 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 the scripture. Yeah. And then the, the, it was a daily devotion by Kenneth Copeland. And I okay. read the message he had when I read the scripture. Um, I, I picked up the Bible and I, I went to that scripture there. Now, now, as a kid growing up, mom used to send us down to my grandmother's house in Mississippi. And my oh, okay. dear loved Jesus. Right. So we would go down and get spiritually fed every summer. Yes. But at the end of the summer, we'd be back up in the streets of New York. Yeah. But in that, on yeah. that day, in that prison cell, and I started reading my Bible, something started cracking wide open on the inside. And the more and more I read, the less angry I got. You know, and I tell people that, you know, when you're in solitary confinement, you're supposed to be in there by yourself. And I tell them, no, I was not. It was me, Jesus, and Kenneth Copeland. So right. after spending that yeah. time there, <clears throat> I was about to go get sentenced, about to face all that time. And that's when I paid, let's make a deal with God. I asked God to go before me in the courtroom. And I said, you know, can you climb into the robe of that judge? Hmm. And I asked God to search the med meditation of my heart. And I said to him, I know that I know that I know that you're real. You revealed yourself to me in that prison cell. And I said, if you go before me in this courtroom and, and, and move Judge Mahan right out of the way, right? And whatever time yeah. that I get, God, let it come from you. Let you be my judge. And I said, whatever it is, whether it's 10 years or 50 years, search the meditation of my heart. Whatever mm -hmm. it is, I'm going to spend the rest of my life serving you.
Wow. And I stepped up in that courtroom and unmistakably God showed up. Is that right? Oh, absolutely. 100%. Tell me what happened that day. You know, we were, we were, we were there and uh, Judge Mahan said something like, <clears throat> you know, you have anything to say before I sentence you? And I was like, man, you bet I do. So I opened up my mouth and just started just, just sputtering things out. As a matter of fact, I didn't even know what it was that I said, Dale. I had to go back and look at my sentence and transcripts to realize. Transcript. But wow. the Bible says that when you find yourself in situations like that, don't worry about what to say, that the Holy Spirit would give you utterance. And, and were you talking about Jesus? Oh, absolutely. Oh, okay. And then Judge Mahan, who's my dear friend to this day, yes. uh, he said something to me before he imposed sentence. He said to me that, you know, Mr. Ponda, I've sat on this bench for how many years I was there. He said that, you know, I have never heard anybody say what it was that you said. He says, if when you go to prison, if you do half of what it is you said you're going to do, you're going to walk out that penitentiary a transformed man. Right. And then he said something to me that just resonates to this day. He says, I don't know why I'm going to do this. Wow. But he says that I'm not going to give you what you deserve. And that's evidence of a God who sent his son that we might not get what it was that we deserve. Yes. So he, uh, you know, he sentenced me to a much lesser sentence than the 23 years. Wow. wow. So walking back to so my God prison cell, there. I'm yeah. crying. I fall down on my face and I'm shackled by my hands and my feet. And I'm thanking God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You showed up. And I heard God whisper to me. He said, listen, my son, I honored what you asked me to do. You Never forget him. the yeah. promise that you made to me. And from that day, I got up off that floor, Dale, and my life went in a 180 degree turn in the opposite direction, and I never looked back. That's wonderful. Yeah. Now, when you got back to the to the penitentiary, or mm -hmm. you, you you were it, it, that was the next step, right? Right. Yes. Was that here? Was that in Nevada? Uh, that was in Nevada where I got sentenced. Oh, at. okay. But yeah. when I went to go do my uh, prison time, I had to do time in a maximum security United States federal penitentiary. Oh boy. So they put me on the plane and they. They flew me off to Allenwood, Pennsylvania, oh boy. Uh, behind 50-foot walls where wow. the vast majority of people in the compound, they're not ever coming home. You know, just give, give folks like that a thousand years. Wow. But it was inside that environment where God had men that were positioned for me. Tell me, tell me what, you, what you did when you were back in the prison um, to maintain your faith. Right. Because that had to really be tough. Right. It was, yeah, it was a challenge. It really was a challenge. 1,150 people on the, uh, on the, on the compound. Yeah. Uh, back on the East Coast, it was a lot of people from the Nation of Islam. Okay. So people that did not believe in the same God that I believed in. Yeah. Um, you know, when you go to prison, you know, you, you have to, you know, get connected with different people, right? And, you know, because of an affiliation. You need to protect yourself. Absolutely. And because yeah. of an affiliation I had many years ago, mm -hmm. it was like I was automatically drawn into that particular group of people and mm. they were asking me to you know come on in and come with us and but Dale I never forgot that promise that I made to God right I, I said that I'm walking away from this life God just give me the strength by the power of your Holy Spirit to resist the gravitational pull back into that life yes. and he did 100 percent were you fearful that that there would be reprisals from these guys who wanted you back in the gang? Oh, absolutely, 100%. Yeah. And, you know, I tell everyone with no shame, I was absolutely scared to death. Yeah. There was times where I did not, I really did not know whether or not I was coming home. Yeah. Right? But yeah. I'll never forget the day when, you know, the when the rubber hit the road and I had to go and confront them, right, was called up to the, you know, table with the rest of the people that was affiliated with the gang. And, and I prayed before I went up there and, and just asked God to be there with me, right, mm -hmm. because I made a promise to you, I know you're not going to leave me here. Yes. And I walked up to the table and I just said to them that, do not call me back up to this table anymore, right? I, if, unless you want to talk about the Bible, you want to talk about Jesus, you want to talk about and the proven, the caliber of how you're going to live the rest of your life, don't call me anymore. And I turned around and walked away. And as I turned around and walked away, I knew that there were people that were there waiting for the nod of the head from one of, like, one of the, the bosses there, you know, stab me, beat me up, whatever the case would be, but yeah. nobody moved. And from that day forward, I turned around and walked away. And the ironic part about it, and this is why when I go back in prisons now, I share people that want to walk away from the gangs, yeah. right? Those same men that were there that were prepared to kill me, 
you know, a year and a half later, these were the guys that were coming up to me and say, hey, listen, I respected what you did back there. My grandmother's a Christian. Can Is you that... pray for this? Oh. So I had an opportunity to stand on the prison yard yeah. and now pray for people and, you know, have, them to, you know, have an opportunity to introduce you to, to, to the, the Jesus Christ that saved my life. So you were a de facto chaplain. You know, yeah. You know, without portfolio, yeah, exactly. At that point, yeah. But what a wonderful, what a wonderful experience yeah. that was. Uh, we need to take a brief break, John. When we come back, I want to continue a little bit about the transformation, uh, the redemption of your life, and then I want to get into it to talking about hope for prisoners, sure. and also talk about the the justice system and what's going on in America today. Okay. We'll be back with the wonderful. John Ponder, right after these messages. You know, one of the worst feelings imaginable is the feeling of being alone. I mean, this is why solitary confinement is one of the cruelest punishments ever in human history. Yeah, we were designed for relationships. The most meaningful thing in life is to be truly known by another person. But this can actually be kind of scary too. I mean, what if I let people down? Or what if when someone learns who I really am, they'll realize they can't really love me? I mean, how are we supposed to really find meaningful relationships? And so the Bible speaks to all of this. It says that God created the world in order to share with us the beauty of existence. God's desire for us is to have significant friendships, to be part of families, to create things and to share our work with others. And all the while depending on God as our source of love and life. But here's the thing, there's so many barriers to that. There's loneliness, fear, hatred. And the Bible claims that these are a result of our being disconnected from God. Without God, we don't actually know who we are anymore. But at the center of the Bible story is Jesus, who wants to bring us back into a relationship with God. Jesus claimed that God loves us for who we are, and that he calls us into a relationship with him despite our failures. And when you realize how loved you are by God, that he is not ashamed of you, it changes everything. It gives you a source of love that is not your own. So the story of the Bible is calling us into the most important relationship. Yeah, it's calling us to know and be known by the Creator God Himself. Hello everyone, I'm Dale Davidson of the Christian TV program, Las Vegas Tonight. I have a brief message for you that I pray will give you hope. The Bible tells us, do not fear, 365 times. That's a wonderful reminder for us each and every day of the year. Please believe that when bad things happen, God is not to blame. We live in a fallen world and the evil one we call the devil wants to bring us pain. Understand that the Lord is by our side, walking us through our trials and bringing us peace. I ask you now to pray to God for peace deep in your soul. Please join me in this prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, please give me peace. Help me to shake off worry and truly know that you're the one in charge. I know that through my faith in your son, Jesus Christ, I will spend eternity with you in your glorious kingdom, heaven. Help me to understand that you'll protect me from harm and give me the strength to love other people as the creatures that you've created. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And God bless you. Welcome back to Las Vegas Tonight. I'm your host, Dale Davidson. We're excited to have John Ponder with us. He's the founder and CEO of Hope for Prisoners, a terrific organization that is being copied all over the country now, isn't it? Yes, yeah. it certainly is. Yeah, people coming to you and saying, how can we help the, the prisoner population reintegrate into society? Right, Yeah. Right. Yeah, so what kind of cities are coming and talking to you about that? Yeah, and because of the, the success that we've had here yeah. with helping formerly incarcerated people return back to the community and never reoffend again, right. because of the partnership that God brought us alongside, like the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, there are cities that are asking us to export our model into their jurisdiction. So we're uh, city of Milwaukee, 
We've wow. already exported a model there, but we're on the phone with Dallas and Phoenix and Atlanta, Philadelphia, That's great. and even the neighbor in the neighborhood in New York where I grew up, where it all started. A Is that right? Yeah. Oh. Talk about God bringing things full circle. Karma. Yes. And a complete circle. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. My last my last guest was uh, Michael Hatch, River Michael oh, Hatch. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, he talked about the Mayor's Faith Initiative, mm -hmm. which you know integrates into what you're doing. Sure. And uh, and also about Milwaukee. He mentioned the right. same thing. You yes. Know, they they have the same kind of problems all the major cities do. Yeah. 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 And how can and and uh, incarceration is a big part of it. Mm -hmm. um, the president has been talking about uh, criminal justice reform. Mm -hmm. uh, I think part of that means these stiff mandatory sentences for particularly drug offenses uh, will go away, mm -hmm. which might be a, a really good thing. Uh, what's your take on what the federal government and the local governments are thinking about doing when it comes to criminal justice reform. Right. Well, we, we really had to take a look at those things because a lot of things, unfair sentencing practices and uh, people getting um, disproportionate yeah. uh, uh, sentences. 20 and, years for a little marijuana exactly. or something. Yeah. So very grateful that yeah. uh, President Trump and his administration had taken a look at that and created the First Step Act yeah. to be able to take a look at all those things. But they took it one step further, which is one of the things I'm really excited about, uh, and, and started asking questions questions uh, uh, to the pastors and leaders all over this country. Uh, what can we do inside our prison system to better equip men and women for when they are getting released so they can make sure they're successfully reintegrate back into their family, back into the workplace? And then more importantly, how do we create an environment on the outside, inside those communities that's going to help them to be successful? One of the, one of the problems is, you know, you talked about your old neighborhood. Uh, probably had you gone immediately back to your old neighborhood when you got out of that prison, mm -hmm. even though you'd come to Christ, it would have been even more difficult. Sure. Because you had all of, all of your old buddies were around. Right. Um, is there a program whereby the guys and gals who are in trouble and uh, out on parole um, can leave and go to another jurisdiction okay. or avoid their old haunts? Um, that, that would seem to me to be a serious issue. Right, and those are some of the things that yeah. we're uh, taking a look at. You would certainly need to get uh, laws changed from that, yeah. you know, especially in the, in the federal prison system. Um, that you need to return back to the community where your instant offense oh, really? uh, have been taken. So that may may or may not be uh, in you know in the local community where you know where you live in. But yeah. the beauty about the Hope for Prisons model is that we have an opportunity to work with them up to 18 months prior to them being released here inside the state of Nevada. And in doing so, we're able to provide them with wraparound services, number one, to address the needs around the circumstances that led to their incarceration. Right. But we also do an assessment so that we can see, uh, you know, what is it that that person is coming home to? Right? Are they coming right. home to a gang affiliation? Are they coming home to a family that's going to support them? Right. And if that family's there, what does that dynamic look like? Is there something that we can do to assess those family members so that as they transition back into the home, we're right there with them to yeah. lend them that support? Now, other than a parole officer, are there, are there um, people within the system that are, that are social workers or whomever um, that are working with them when they get out, or are they on their own yeah. when it comes to this? So once, once they get released, this is why it's so important that the Hope for Prisons mechanism uh, is in place there. Yeah. Uh, they do have their parole officer there, and we have a great working relationship with Nevada Department of Parole and Probation to where yeah. we bring the parole officers. They're, in a sense, in on the case management, working with my team. Okay. doing everything that they possibly can to help them to be successful. There's a lot of models that don't have that. Yes. There's a lot of models that have a, a training inside prison, uh, and then once that person walks out the back door after they completed their time, they're released back in the community without the support. And they're on their uh, own. And they are absolutely on their own. But the, mm -hmm. you know, but the, but the challenge is if, if, if we were to continue doing that, then yeah. uh, we're wasted time, effort, energy, and resources. They have to have that support to be able to help them now to navigate the different challenges they're going to be facing during the reintegration process. Yeah. Being away for 20 years has to be an incredible, um, difficult situation. I mean, 
things have happened in the last 20 years when you think about technology and what's happened to technology. Um, morality changes, all different kinds of things in the family dynamics and in the workplace. Mm -hmm. um, that has to be a difficult thing. Do they get so acclimated to, to life in prison that, that they can't function in the, in the modern society? We absolutely do, and they, and they call that institutionalized. Uh, and that's the thing that Hope for Prisons looks to break up uh, inside the prison system. We gotta break that cycle of institutionalization. Because if you're in prison, and let's just say you have done things in prison, you, uh, every single day you wake up and you do the same exact thing. Yeah. Right, But the problem is in, in our country, the infrastructure of a prison system, the day-to-day -day activities in a prison system, creates habits that, that are the exact opposite of successful reentry. So in other words, if right. you continue to do that pattern of behavior three or four times a day over the next 10 years, it will be impossible for you to become, come home and become a, a successful member in the community. Right. But that's what it is that we need to break up. But more importantly, uh, just as the men and women who are inside that environment, right. uh, you know, they can become institutionalized. One of the things that I found when I came home from prison back in 2009 is that the community had become institutionalized. What do you mean? Because this is the way that we've always done prison reentry. This is the way we've always treated people coming home from the prison system. Right. So what we had to do is we had to break that up. This is why it's so important that we pulled in everybody from the community to be a part of that support. And if you think about it, Jesus uh, taught uh, in parables. And one right, of the sure. things that Jesus said was that you cannot put new wine and pour yeah. it into old wine skin. That's but right. what it happens yeah. is even the, the government, they were coming up with these all fresh ideas on how to treat people in this segment of the population. But what they were doing was they were taking all these great ideas and pouring them into an antiquated wine skin called the community. Wow. That old wine skin lacks the flexibility. So it was the police and the and the parole people and potential job Employers. people and all of that. You got to bring yeah. in, and that makes yeah. up. This is why Hope for Prisons is so successful. Those community partners plus us meet in the middle. We create the very fabric of a brand new wineskin, and this is why it has been so successful. Now let's talk about jobs. Um, you must have had difficulty knocking on the doors and saying. I'm an ex-con and I'm trying to help other ex-cons. Yeah. Will you hire them? Yeah. Yeah. Tell me how that yeah. worked. And it, you need, now we can see the what's happened. Right. This is good stuff. Right. But right. What was right. that like? What was that first call like? Oh, it was it was very <laughs> very very challenging. And yeah. then back in 2009 2010, we're getting up and running. You know, one of the most important things that that we we need to do is help make sure that we're getting formerly incarcerated people good jobs where they can earn a sustainable ways to yeah. take care of themselves and their family. And and not have to commit yeah, crimes. Exactly, yeah. and, and the challenge back then, I, we couldn't get folks jobs more than the eight twenty to five an hour telemarketing job. Right. So what we did was we we started having conversations with a few employers, big and small, uh, and we we don't believe in job placement. What we sold the employers are was that if you hire someone from Hope for Prisons, you're not just hiring them. You're hiring this entire army of people that are going to be with them to make sure that once they get inside that workplace, they're going to go above and beyond the call of duty. You're going to get a great return on your investment. So right. when we convince, you know, five or ten employers to do that, uh, they, they had gotten so good that the employers kept coming back saying, can we get, you know, five or ten more of those? And, oh, wow. you know, and that had just grown over yeah. the years, more partnerships coming on board. And, you know, right before COVID hit, our organ, right. we were sitting on more jobs than our organization can fill. Oh, that's an, that's right? phenomenal. And it didn't have anything yeah. to do with us. We know God yeah. had breathed on that, but it had everything to do with the men and women who were coming home from prison, got inside that workplace. They they utilized the, the, the leadership skills that we trained them with yeah. and got inside those workplaces and began to soar like superstars. Wow. Now, the thing about, about all of that is clearly... It's God breathed, Absolutely. as you said. Um, do obviously 
I'm sure many of the prisoners come to Christ, mm -hmm. um, but it's not a requirement, right? right. No, it's they, not a they don't need to, to be a Christian. Yeah. But you, yeah. do you encourage it? Do you just live live it and 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 be a model for them? Yeah, absolutely. That, you know, yeah. you know, Dale, and I, I'll put it to you this way, right? I know that there are some men and women who are coming home from prison that do not believe in the same God I believe in. Yes. Hey, man, we want to do everything we can to help them. Yeah. Right. So, you know, once they get in, we have an opportunity to help them. Then if they want to have a conversation about Jesus, absolutely. You want to attend a Bible study? Absolutely. If you don't, that's OK, too. Yeah. You know, we are going to live out the scriptures. And if we live out the scriptures and love on people the way we need to love on them, maybe they'll see the Jesus on the inside of us and be able to have that, you know, have that conversation. Wow. Yeah. Um, do you take tax tax money? Do you take federal money or state oh, money? Oh, absolutely. Do we oh, we okay. do. Uh, we were able to, and it's, it's kind of funny too because I had a conversation with somebody about this this morning. Uh, you know, when I first got everything got everything up and running in 2009, 2010, we weren't in the position to qualify grants, right? Because we didn't have a track number. Here's this, yeah, this formerly yeah. incarcerated guy that <laughs> they, they they didn't know that Jesus touched my life and transformed my life. Yeah. So everything that we uh, that we did was built off of personal and private donations. Right. You know, work with a lot of people, uh, you know, Christians and dependent on some of the churches for monthly support. And oh, out man. of that laid the foundation for us to build up this godly mm -hmm. uh, 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 model mm -hmm. that then the other folks took notice um, at how people were having their lives changed. And, and you are high profile. It's amazing because I've, I've watched it since right. the beginning. Uh, I think we met right about then, maybe 2010, sure. when, when uh, my former my friend and former business partner guy williams and i were yep, working yep. together and starting keen you were starting hope for prisoners yes. and uh to watch what you know how high profile you are and your organization now is it's got to be the hand of god it, it, it has to be i i you know tell people all the time i couldn't do it, do it myself you know hope for prisoners was a vision that god impregnated me with while i was in prison behind 50 foot walls and i came home in 2009 dug trenches and God gave birth to it, but I could not even imagine back then in my feeble thinking that it would be what it is today, yeah. that we've had a chance to work with over 3,400 men and women is that have right? been through our process. 3,400, 3, that's 4, fabulous. 3,400 men and women. And, you know, I happened to be watching live uh, on, that, on that fateful day in, in the Rose Garden when uh, you became internationally famous <laughs> and uh and tell me how that tell me how that came about that yeah. uh that you were called up to the dais by the president of the united states right who said hey nice to meet you john yeah and, yeah. and i gotta tell you what a, what an absolute honor yeah. uh, that was and i had gotten a phone call that there was a, a meeting that was taking place where they were discussing criminal justice and so forth and so on. So uh, I had gotten invited to the White House oh, okay. uh, for this meeting. And at the meeting, I had a chance to speak with some of the president's officials. Pastor Paula White was there. And, oh, sure. And I actually left the White House and then my phone rang. Uh, and, you know, they asked me and said, hey, you know, Chaplain Ponder, are you still in D.C.? And I was yeah, sure. They said, well, would you mind coming back to the White House? It's something we want to discuss with you. So I hurried back to the White House. <laughs> And uh, when they and, call, you do and, that. Yeah, exactly. I was like, yeah. man, I hit the, 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 the lift button. I'm on my way. I just got to go <laughs> catch up with me. But when I get back to the White House, um, you know, the, the people that were in the room early meeting, uh, they had a conversation with the president. They was telling them all the, the work, what God is doing, uh, not only in my life, but what, how God is using my testimony to impact the lives of thousands of people. And that's when they said to me that uh, the president would be honored if you would be his guest at the National Day of Prayer. Wow. So I was like, oh my gosh, what an honor. Wow. And then in addition to that, the FBI agent, who's my best friend to, the day, yeah. to this day, who was the arresting agent on my case, who is on fire for Jesus, wow. they asked if he could come and attend. So uh, we had the privilege of standing in the Rose Garden with the, the FBI agent that was right I by my it. side. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, the, the powerful thing about that is that, you know, the, the president of the United States in front of millions of people told the, about the transformative power of Jesus in my life. Yeah. Yeah. What, a, what an opportunity. And, and, and can God work anything for good? Oh, absolutely. What, a, what a, an amazing, amazing story. Yeah. And proof of that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah.
And we're having such a great time here on Las Vegas tonight. We'll be back with John Ponder right after these messages. John was in and out of jail for years until at age 38, he was arrested for bank robbery. You don't look like a bank robber, John. <laughs> it's come a long way. John soon ended up in federal prison, relegated to solitary confinement. That's where God found him. John began to read the Bible and listen to Christian radio, right? Incredible. One morning at 2 a.m., he woke up to the voice of the great Billy Graham. Reverend Graham's words came through the airwaves. Jesus wants to be Lord of your life. That night, John dedicated his life to Christ. He spent the rest of his time in prison praying, studying the Bible, and bringing the Lord to his fellow inmates. The day after John's release, a visitor knocked on his door. It was the man who put him in jail, FBI Special Agent Richard Beasley. Who's here? Richard? Come on up, Richard. I want you to know that I've been praying for you very strongly. He said that God called me to the FBI in part because of you, John. The two are now lifelong friends. John, do you like him? I love him. Oh, you love him. <laughs> That's nice. That's beautiful. John runs a ministry that has helped more than 2,000 former inmates rejoin society, and he's the talk of the country. The job John does is incredible. John and Richard, you are a living testament to the power of prayer. Your story reminds us that prayer changes hearts and transforms lives. It uplifts the soul, inspires action, and unites us all as one nation under God. We are back with John Ponder of Hope for Prisoners. And uh, what a terrific, terrific interview he's done so far. Um, Let's talk about the future a little bit and hope for prisoners and your personal future as well, sure. if you don't mind. Uh, first of all, here's a question. You thought about uh, running for office? Oh, my goodness. You got the charisma, John. <laughs> if my wife was here in this room right now, she'd probably throw a light at she'd you or something. She'd be doing this? <laughs> I, say, I don't think so. Yeah, well, you never know what God has in store. Yeah, you know, I want to yeah. do what God has, uh, you know, called me to do. Yeah. Uh, you know, if that time does come uh, and he's truly called me, if it could be a, a benefit or impact to yeah. uh, to uh, people, uh, then, you know, maybe I'm all in. That'd be a nice capstone yeah. to your career, wouldn't it? Possibly, yeah. 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 So uh, he's going to be running for governor. <laughs> <laughs> we just decided for John that that's what's going to happen. <laughs> but uh, hey. helping to facilitate that is uh, I've been I've heard that uh, a pardon is in the is in the uh, yeah. is in the works yes. for you. A presidential a, pardon. A presidential pardon. Wow. What, a, what an absolute wow. honor that is. How did that come about? You know, you just I, heard about yeah, it. They were know, working on it. Yeah, President Trump came out to our uh, graduation ceremony and spoke, which was just really incredible. Yeah. Uh, it was at the headquarters of the police department, and uh, you know. Uh, uh, President Trump came out um, onto the platform, and as he was introducing, um, you know, he thanked me and said that, you know, somebody told him that, you know, I deserve the presidential pardon. And he says that I think that's something that we can uh, consider. 
Wow. So we've had the conversation. Uh, we there's know, a process. Isn't yeah, there? there's a process. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But you know what? What an honor it is. And I remember going home, uh, and the biggest honor for me is that uh, my little girls, uh, who was there that day, were yeah. telling me oh, how she? how proud she is of her dad. That the dad, you know, met with the president and getting the president's your partner. I don't even know if she realize what that was <laughs> yeah. but dad you get how old is she she's eight years old wow, right but you know that she's getting the president's your pardon both of her to be able to say that you know how proud we are oh, uh, yeah. of your dad it was just phenomenal so later on that day um because i was excited and i was happy about it and i was you know, on the side of my bed and was praying and and they all got to re remind me that presidential pardon is is huge it's big. yeah yeah, but God it's had very rare. Yeah, very, very rare. Yeah. But God had reminded me that he pardoned me years ago. Wow. Right? Yeah. And that's the important one. That is the absolutely yeah. important one. So yeah. whether it comes or not comes or whatever <laughs> the case would be, yeah. you know, I stand firm and just hold on that, you know, that my God has pardoned and forgiven me yes. for all those things from my past. Um, so I don't have to look back into those things. Uh, anymore, yeah. right? And press forward to those things that God has, uh, you know, in store for my future. And that's the beautiful part of of the Lord's grace. Yes, you know, it's a unmerited favor. That's right. We don't, we don't have, we don't owe it. We're, we're not owed it. That's right. But it's just an amazing right. thing that yeah. we get to have. Absolutely. Isn't it? Is your is your mother still with us? Yes, my mom is still alive. And yeah, so she was proud of you. I'll yes. Bet. Oh my See goodness. See you at the White House. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. 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 What did she say to you? Oh, she was just telling me again how proud she was. I uh, mean, you know, my mom being uh, being around to see me the way I'm today, that really blesses my heart because one of my prayers after I had given my life to the Lord and I knew that I was going to become the person that my mom always saw in me. Even when I was in trouble, my mom always saw me for who I had the potential to become. God bless mothers. Right, yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. I know she was doing some private praying. So uh, on the other side of this now, mm -hmm. uh, for me to be able to show my mom and my mom sees me now, I go to her house and uh, there's newspaper clippings and magazine covers <laughs> that she that she has. This is my so, boy. Abs absolutely. Yeah. So, but again, yeah. it's 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 it gives me extreme gratification because yeah. I ask God to keep my mom alive. Don't let her die while I'm in prison. Yeah. Right. And she's been through cancer and and and, oh. and remission and and so that you know that she's able to see that to this day. God I mean, that her. really really blesses that, my that heart. That is the yeah. That has to bless her. Yes. Heart, yeah. To see her son. Yes become what you have become. Right, what yeah. an amazing thing. Well, praise God. Let's talk about America right now in a little bit. Uh, as I think I mentioned, I had uh, um, Michael Hatch on the show mm -hmm. last week, and we talked about the racial divide. So yes. um, he, he was very honest and straightforward in saying that that uh, some of these protests are, call, are definitely called for. Mm -hmm. uh, he was strongly against rioting, right. you know, saying that's crazy to burn your own neighborhood mm -hmm. down. Mm -hmm. um, but first and foremost, uh, the Lord loves us all. That's right. He loves us all equally. That's right. Um, but prejudice does exist. Mm -hmm. And that had to play a role in your growing up. Tell me about that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It really did play. A, so that was very much a part of everything that I grew up with. Right. Yeah, sure. And then, you know, uh, the other thing that was I was uh, was very much a part of my growing up is that, you know, I hated the police. In my neighborhood, when we grew up, you know, I could under I could see where they're coming from yeah. because you know we sat there and we witnessed all of that, and um, you know, growing up hating the police and hating the police brutality and uh, right. doing all these unjustified things, and you know, I, I'm very proud to say today that I s support the police. Some of my best friends on this planet yeah. are, are men and women from the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. I know. And they, one of the yeah. things that I learned in my own life, right, that took place with me. Um, if you ever thought about how close that word enemy comes to the inner me wow. and how I spent a lifetime yeah. fighting the enemies on the outside right. until I took a look at the enemies that were laying dormant on the enemy. And once I conquered the yeah. enemy on the enemy, the enemies on the outside disappeared. I like that. And that's when I come to realization for John yeah. Ponder, it was never the police. It was always everything that was going on on the inner me. Yeah. And the minute I saw that black and white or that blue uniform, man, it's game on now. But yeah. the Bible says that when I was a child, I thought like a child, yes. I acted like a child, and I did childish things. But when I became a man, 
I put the childless things away. And the minute I put the childless things away, the enemies on the outside disappeared. Yeah. Right? And, and what a great example you are for younger people. But tell me what you would say to them, those that are still very ang angry, or justifiably so in many cases, yeah. um, taking it out on other people mm -hmm. and property. Right. Um, right. You must have the opportunity to talk to younger people, whether they're uh, incarcerated or not. Mm -hmm. What do you say to them? And the first thing I say to them is that you, you know, you protest. You should protest. We have a right that your voices are heard, mm -hmm. right? But violence, freedom of speech and freedom, absolutely, to peaceably assemble. Absolutely, yeah. but you have to understand that violence only gets more violence. Yeah. So one of the things that we're working on right now, on a national level, is after you have the protests, after the voices are heard, we want to create a, a platform so that we can really start to dig deep into the, the reason for the protests, Yeah. right? And then make sure that you bring some lawmakers and some law enforcement to that table, mm -hmm. along with those you know, legislators, so we can create some, uh, some, some legislation, mm -hmm. right? To make sure those things get addressed. Mm -hmm. Because we don't want to put a bandaid on it. We, you know, we, I remember the, the Rodney King rise here in, in 1992, so do I. right? Big gigantic protests and yeah. people were marching and then we put some band-aids on this thing until it happened again. Yeah, right. And we don't want to just keep doing this every few years. Right. Yeah. And there, are, there are fundamental problems. Mm -hmm. um, when people talk about systemic racism, it exists. Absolutely, it does. But there's got to be a way that, and I think you're right. It's going to take talking. Yeah, absolutely. And communicating. And, right. And part of the the mayor's faith initiative and and uh, the safe streets and mm -hmm. you know all these different kinds of programs. Mm -hmm. Talking and communicating is crucial. Oh, absolutely, 100%. Yeah. It is. And, yeah. You know, one of the discussions that we're going to be having here uh, in, the, in the near future, uh, it's because that, that partnership we built up with OVMPD, right? Yeah. To where the yeah. sheriff has given me almost 100 volunteer mentors and trainers for our organization, helping people to come wow. home from prison to go back into that community. Wow. So a lot of the challenges, even the things that are being talked about in the police reform, which is necessary. Yeah. You know, we've been doing that here in our local community for years. Yeah. You know, the, from the community orient policing to where yeah. the officers get out in the community and go and read in schools and, right. and, and, and uh, hold events and attend the churches and the synagogues and the mosques, building up relationships. Both sides get to see we're people. Absolutely. And you then know? the sheriff interacting, uh, uh, enacting his multicultural advisory Council, yeah. which you have leaders of the community that hear the cries of the people that report up to the sheriff, you know, on a monthly basis. So it's always up in the so radar. Here's what's going on. Here's what's going on and what can we do? And the sheriff execute and his team execute an action item. Good. But that's what we're going to be doing is that we uh, got reached out to, uh, because the White House and the DOJ uh, knows about the, the success we've had. And so they're, they're going to do a national Zoom call. And on, oh, the really? on the national Zoom call, it's yeah. coming down the pipe relatively quick here, they're going to have everybody, the higher-ups in the Department of Justice, they're going to have people from the White House administration. But the DOJ is making a, a, an invite to all the law enforcement agencies across our country to bring them to this table. And under Sheriff Kevin McMahill oh, yeah. and yeah. I, yeah. they're going to give us a platform to talk about what it is that we're building up here in, uh, in inside Nevada. So yeah. we're excited about that. that. That's a wonderful thing. And, and this as a model uh, is key. And police departments listen to other police departments, yeah. right? Yeah. So they might say, is this actually working, Sheriff? Right. Yes. And he says, yeah. yeah. And here's, what, here's the way to handle this. Absolutely. And that could stop things like what happened in Minneapolis from happening. Absolutely, you know? and that's what the ultimate goal is for us yeah. to be able to stop census, things like that. Yeah. But the only way that we can be able to do that is not with this divide, yeah. right? We need to come together in unprecedented, uh, unprecedented ways, not only as a community, and as a state, yeah. but as a nation, yeah. and begin to see people the way God sees people and love on people the way God needs, to, uh, you know, needs us, the way they, he loves on people. 
Isn't that really the key? Absolutely, you know? it is. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, John, you you are very articulate, and and you talk with people in in a in a very powerful way about Jesus, uh, and through your chaplaincy, you have the opportunity to do it a lot. I wonder whether. Um, this is your camera right here. Whether sure. we, you wouldn't mind addressing the camera mm -hmm. and talk to the people out there who maybe don't know Christ, mm -hmm. and talk a little bit about uh, about your experience and and what Jesus has meant to you. Sure. And then uh, bring them to Christ if you right. want. Whatever okay. you want to say. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you got a couple minutes. Sure. So use it, them. It, yeah. it is an absolute honor and a privilege to be able to uh, to share this with you. Uh, you guys had an opportunity to hear my testimony, hear those things that, uh, you know, where I came from, uh, what my life was like before I surrendered my life to the Lord, uh, where I was in an absolute hot mess and just finding myself in situation, this never-ending uh, vicious rut of doing the same thing over and over and over again. Until the age of 37 years old, I looked back over the last 30 years, 37 years of my life and didn't accomplish anything of great significance. And more than that, I left a path, a path of destruction because I didn't know who I was, growing up with the falsehoods of masculinity. And that day when I was in that prison cell and I surrendered my, my life to the Lord and asked God to, to, to be the Lord of my life, right? To, to, to show me who it is, that, not that the person that I was, show me who it is that you created me to be. And as God began to reveal things about him, the more and more I learned about him, the more and more I began to understand about me and who it was that he created me to be. And that's when I came to the realization that I, I wasn't the name that the streets gave me. I wasn't the name that the people said I was. You know, I am who my God says that I am, and I can do all those things that my God says that I can do. And that made all the difference in the world for me. As I indicated earlier today, the minute I uh, surrendered my life to the Lord, I never looked back. I invited him to be the Lord of my life. I invited him to be my friend. And today he is my friend. He's someone who lives on the inside of me. And now I have the opportunity not only for me, but to be able to in, you know, impact my family, to share the love of Jesus with my wife and share the love of Jesus with my kids and be able to share the love of Jesus with, with everyone that I come in contact with to let them know that there's, there's a life out there. Jeremiah 29, 11 says that I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. It's a plan to prosper you, not to harm you. It's a plan to give you a hope, and it's a plan to give you a future. And wherever you are right now in your life today, if you may find yourself in that place that I was, that saying, you know, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, or saying that I know that I know that I know that life has to be more than what it is that I've been living. If somehow something was different and you never really knew what that difference was. Well, for me, my friends, Jesus is a difference maker. So if that's something that you consider doing it right now, you know, my conversation with you is to have a conversation with your local pastor. Feel free to reach out to have a conversation with me at, at Hope for Prisons. Reach out. Let's have a conversation. Let's talk. But before we go, it'd be an absolute honor for those of you who listen, if this is applicable to you, if you just close your eyes and just repeat after me. Because the Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and, Lord, Lord, Lord and Savior, then you will be saved. So if you just bow your head right now and pray with me and repeat after me, say, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. I thank you for dying for me. I thank you for dying for me. I thank you for going to the cross. I thank you for going to the cross. I thank you for going to the grave. I thank you for going to the grave. I believe in my heart. I believe in my heart. That three days after you died. That three days after you died. By the power of the Holy Spirit. By the power of the Holy Spirit. You arose from the dead. You arose from the dead. And ascended into the heaven. And ascended into the And heavens, is sitting at the right hand of the throne. And are sitting at the right hand of the throne. And you're, ju you're judging the living and the dead. Judging the living and the dead. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. I ask you to forgive me for my sins. I ask you to forgive me for my sins. I ask you to take those sins and to cast them into the sea of forgetfulness. Oh, yes. 
see your forgiveness. I plead the blood of Jesus over those sins. I plead the blood of Jesus over And I invite sins. you to be the Lord of my life. And I invite you to be the Lord of my life. Teach me. Teach me. Love me. Love me. And be my Lord and Savior. And be my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' magnificent name. In Jesus' magnificent name. We say amen. We say amen. Wow. Thank you, John. Oh, it is my That was wonderful. Honor. It is Thanks my for honor. coming on the yes, show. Yes, it's my honor. Man, let it not be so long. Yes. You know, <laughs> come again. Governor, <laughs> See, go, go home and tell your wife that we all we took a poll here right. and everybody said you should run for yeah, governor next time. Fight. You and I both. <laughs> <laughs> that I get. I have one of those myself. Yes. So there we go. Thanks so much. John. My honor. Thank John you. Ponder of Hope for Prisoners. And uh, we've been putting up his contact information and his website and all uh, throughout the show. So you'll have an opportunity to get in touch with him. Awesome. Yeah. You're looking for volunteers? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Always looking for volunteers. Okay. Mentors and absolutely. Oh, that's great. Yeah. The, the, harvest is, the harvest is plenty, but the labor is a few. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that yeah. always the way? Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. And thanks for being one of those laborers. Thank you, sir. Yeah. My honor. God bless you. And as I try to say each and every episode of Las Vegas tonight, when it comes to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, please walk with him. Bye-bye. Hi, I'm Dale Davidson, host of Las Vegas Tonight. You know, radio has an enduring place in the heart of America. Sometimes it's music that can enliven your spirit or keep you company when you need some. More often for me, it's just been the right spoken word or two that can quiet my mind and soul. Radio brings me a reassuring word in the quiet of night or a welcoming voice early in the morning as I shake off the night's sleep and find my way into God's purpose for my day. And always, I find the best radio station is the one that brings me the best news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. My favorite radio station is KKVV in Las Vegas, Nevada. It's still right where it's been for years at 1060 on the AM dial, hovering over Sin City like a gospel airship broadcasting the good news of the abounding love that Jesus Christ has for every single one of us. No matter who you are or where you live, you can receive God's word via the KKVV Gospel Airship. Just go to kkvv.com and click on Listen Live. KKVV is using all the tools that God's provided them, like podcasting and video streaming and video on demand to produce programs that lift up our fellow believers and save the lost. If you feel a calling to speak to others about Jesus Christ on your very own show, pick up the phone and call the station. They'll be happy to tell you how. Call KKVV today at 702-731-5588 or drop them an email at kkvvradio at hotmail.com. Please join me in becoming part of the KKVV family. You'll be glad you did. Come on and shine, shine, shine. Las Vegas, shine your light on me. You've been watching Las Vegas Tonight with your host, Dale Davidson. We hope you've enjoyed this edition of our show. We so appreciate your loyalty to our program. To keep Las Vegas Tonight on the air, please go to our website, vegasaints.org and click the donate button. To send a check or money order, please make it out to Dale Wynn Davidson Ministries and mail it to 9030 West Sahara Avenue, Suite 255, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89117. To suggest a guest to appear on the show or any other suggestions or questions, write to Dale at DaleWDavidson at yahoo.com or call him at 702-480-3989. Shine Las Vegas.